recorded. Right, Mick, carry on what we were talking about off air. So, <laughs> okay. a myotachycardia? Yeah, so a, a tachycardia, yeah, so a fast heart rate. So, um, yeah, gym session, tachycardia, um, just out doing a bag session, um, and my heart just wouldn't settle down. So, um, I knew something was up, but wasn't quite sure what, and I'd, I'd heard about palpitations and the rest of it. So, quick shower, grabbed my bag, off to the med centre, popped in the door. You know, showed the nurse or whoever it was, we know what's going on. I said, you know, something wrong with my heart. So she said, no, you're all right. You're just having a palpitation. It'll pass. Don't worry. And anyway, the ECG's not working, so we can't test. So Why wasn't, why wasn't it working? Batteries are flat, apparently. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so long story shorter, um, I went to see the ADGE and said, look, David, uh, and, you know, he was a pretty serious guy and, We'd have a bit of banter and a laugh, but he knew David? Some, yeah. What rank were you? I was W01 at the time. Right, okay. You know, well, yeah. I addressed him as David because I wanted his immediate attention. Okay. <laughs> so um, he knew straight away something was up. So within a minute, you know, fair play to him, there was a driver outside waiting to whiz me to hospital. So Broadie to Haverford West, Withybush Hospital, probably about 25-minute drive. So I'm, I'm starting to do the maths at this point, realising that I could be in a bit of a bad way. Is your heart still going? Oh, yeah. So it's still, you know, two, three, six it was at. Jesus. Um, so... Text the missus, um, you know, sort of trying to be calm, saying, look, something's happening. I'm not quite sure what, but if I check out on the way, blah, blah, blah. And I said to the driver, if I cream in, just get me to the hospital as quick as you can. You know, just pull it, pull up outside and, you know, go and get someone sort of thing. But as it was, I, I turned up there um, in the same condition as I left the camp. Um, so I went straight up to the, the glass and said, look, I've got something going on with my heart here. And she pushed me through a door on the side and sat me down. And within minutes, I was cabled up on the ECG. Um, and they managed to capture the rhythm, which is useful because they can see what's happening with the heart, what's what it's doing and why. Um, and then they went through into crash into the back. And again, within a few seconds, the shirt was off, padded up, you know, with the old chest zapper pads, ready for a an electronic restart if, if the heart sort of crapped out. So, um, yeah, it was a bit, you know, I mean, seen it happen before in different places and whatever. But when it's you on the other end of it and uh, there's a potential you're going to check out, it's quite scary. Um, so the, the guy just sort of said, look, we're just, just going to sit a while because sometimes they self-correct. Um, and he said, and if you do, if you do cream in, he said, we'll just restart your heart. He said, don't panic. You know, it's all going to be fine. And I was like, all right, you know, and I was quite pragmatic. I thought, okay, he knows what he's talking about. He's getting paid a few quid for doing his job. Um, so, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry came down and was looking and poking and prodding and, um, th then the senior sort of bloke turned up and said, right, we're, we're going to do a, uh, an, in, an injection with a, a drug called flecainide. I have uh, no idea what it is, but he said it's it's a kind of it will correct the, the heart rate. And they said if that fails, then we'll zap you. Uh, luckily, it worked. So I had the injection, and about five minutes later, it was kind of weird, like a really sort of strong heartbeat, a flash of orange, which is a bit weird, and then I was back to normal rhythm, uh, normal heart rhythm. Um, and then I stayed in hospital. I got transferred from there to Cardiff to a specialist heart unit, which, you know, people rubbish the NHS, but they were absolutely spot on with me. I was very straight with the consultant. When was this, mate? Sorry, uh, sorry 2012 now, so October 12. Okay. Um, I was straight with him, and he was really straight with me, so we got on really well. Um, and after uh, a period in hospital doing lots of tests and, you know, stress tests on the heart to try and... What they're trying to do is trigger the rhythm again so they can see what triggers it so they can give the appropriate treatment because sometimes they can get away with just giving you a beta blocker, which is a, a pill that slows the heart down. But as it transpired, I ended up with a defib. So I've got a single lead defibrillator, which sits in my chest, like a pacemaker, if you like, but it does a different job. Um, and it's got a lead that goes into my right ventricle, which is after CT and all the rest of the other scans. That's where they found the anomaly, um, which is like a... Um, I've got, essentially, without getting too technical and scientific, I've got a rogue pathway, which goes from the sinus node down into my um, ventricle. And the electric signals travel down those pathways. And occasionally, one goes a little bit rogue. And um, the heart's reaction is to just start going extremely fast. Now, what should happen is... Um, you, you can manage that usually for about four or five minutes and then the heart goes into what's called fibrillation, yeah. which is a quiver, which is, a, you know, it's inefficient and then it stops and that's cardiac arrest, you're dead. But because I'd done gross cardiovascular overload throughout my career, I was able to maintain the rhythm. Uh, so only through being beasted, <laughs> basically, I survived. So, no, so what should have happened is your heart goes mental and then you croak it. Yeah. But because your heart was the heart of a flipping ox... You didn't croak it. You just kept doing it. Basically, yeah. <laughs> I know. It's mad, isn't it? So, you know, I mean, I, there was no one else in the gym at the time as well. There was one of the other girls, um, one of the sharp majors, actually, playing squash. So she'd have found me brown bread on the floor. 
So that's in your, you got that in your heart now? Yeah, so the, the defib sits just under my um, left collarbone. And I had a... Uh, how, how big is it, mate? It's about that size of a matchbox. Okay. Yeah, so when I was in and obviously I'd realised what was up, uh, you know, and what was going to happen, I started doing my research a little bit. Uh, the NHS standard defib is, it's like a, like a remote control sort of size thing. It's big and chunky. So I did my homework and a company called Boston Scientific had just brought in a load of these things in and they'd um, they got them at Stafford Hospital. So I said to my consultant, look, I said, I'm still a serving soldier. I'm still active. I'm still a family man. And I said, I would like, if possible, to get the smaller defibrillator. You know, I said, I've, I've paid my taxes. I've done my dues. You know, can you try and square it away? Anyway, good as gold. I had to wait a little bit longer, but a few days later, you know, Bob's your uncle, there it was. Tiny little thing compared to the NHS solution, if you like. And um, he managed to tuck it in behind the flesh, behind the pectoral muscle, so it's protected as well. Um, so, you know, they, you know, they did a cracking job. Absolutely cracking job. Does it inhibit any activities you can do? I mean, you know, I, mean, I, went, I went back to work a month later, probably a bit quick, to be honest with you. And, you know, I was doing, I, I was the RSM at the time, so obviously leading by example, I'd back on the CFT, carrying kit and all the rest of it. It was a bit uncomfortable, you know, and it's still a bit like that now. I get like a weird itch. And if I press hard, I can feel the, the device under there. So I just have to be mindful of that. I was doing a lot of mountain biking at the time as well. Um, and I suppose stupidly now looking back, I carried on doing that. But if I'd if I'd come off and, you know, if there'd been a freak accident where the bars had hit me in the upper left chest or, you know, if I'd pulled the cable, it could have been lights out again. So, again, uh, you know, the missus sort of said to me, it's all well and good, you know, you, you'll, you'll just pass away. She goes, we'll be left with all the drama. And I was like, yeah, you're right. So, you know, kind of just sensible up and... Uh, be a bit more uh, well-behaved. The cable's in, it's all internal, right? Everything yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 it's all internal, yeah. So the cable, they nick into a, a vein, a big vein just above the heart, and they feed the cable in. And I was awake for this because I don't do very well under uh, general anaesthetics. So I had local. So I could feel it all, you know, sort of going in and all the rest of it, making the incision, tucking it in behind the ribs. I could feel the casing sort of brushing off the oh, bone. God. It was a bit weird, like, you know, and then uh, <laughs> the woman who was putting it in, uh, she was obviously ace at her job, but the senior consultant was there as well because the bottom of the wire... Is actually, um, it's like a, a spiral thread, like a barb, and they have to turn it a certain amount of times to bury it in the flesh and the muscle at the bottom of the heart. So, you know, he's saying five, six, seven, eight, don't overturn it because it can burst through the bottom, you know. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> but towards the end, it was getting a bit uh, a bit uncomfortable. I'd been been laid there for a couple of hours, and uh, the anaesthetic was starting to wear off, the old uh, lignocaine. So I was starting to get a bit hot and uh, a bit, bit sort of shirty under the collar. But, uh, yeah, it all went well. They stitched me up and, uh, you know, Bob, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> what happened with the career then after that? Well, again, it's a bit of a weird one because um, there's only one other bloke, I think, he's a booty. I'm not sure if he's still serving. He actually went through uh, the commando course with a defib, but the Marines side of things, because it's a core all on their own, they make their own rules. So the Army said, that's not, we're not going to take a lead from that. So it ended up, my doctor, um, you know, screwed the nut for me and he, he sort of held the paperwork back. Um, and I ended up going and getting commissioned. And I, I did a year as an RCMO down in Bath um, at a signal regiment. And then um, I sort of pulled the pin myself. But I'd gone to a board and they said, you know, we're, we can't manage the risk of you going anywhere. And if there's a drama with the device, then we can't support it because it needs specialist equipment. So, you know, I kind of had to just, you know, bite the bullet, I suppose, really, and jump before I was pushed. So um, I departed of my own accord in uh, November 2015. So what was the alternative, med discharge? Yeah, or, I mean, I perhaps, I think if I'd dug my heels in, I could have milked it out for another few years, but, you know, I don't know. I, I, to be honest with you, I was a bit worn out by then as well, and I think at the time when I'd had the operation and I was on the medication, I was just fighting against a sort of losing tide because the medication, it, it flattens me out. Mid-afternoon, I'm getting a bit, bit knackered, like, you know, and I was trying to do the same stuff as I was before, but something changes when you, when you have an operation like that and you've got a device in. Um, it, I don't know. You, you can push against it so hard for so long, but then it, you know, it kind of gets you in the end. Like you, you become more risk aware oh, of the risk as well, don't you? Massively. I yeah. I, I had an accident a, a couple of years back now, and I'm not in terms of risk and worrying about sticking around for the rest yeah. of my life. It's proper in the back of my mind now. Oh yeah, much less reckless. That comes with age as well. I think as well. <laughs> yeah, I think back to when we were young lads and you know young soldiers, like absolutely no care in the world like you know just yeah i'll do it whatever you know followed by the f word and you're in and doing it it's just you know you've got no 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 consequential foreground nothing it's just like yeah we'll just get get it done yeah it's mad but i, I mean still now i think back to that day in the gym and um you know just that could have been it and i think well how many how many open doors and how many 
unclosed off things would I have left behind? And there were thousands. So, you know, all my shit is in a sock now because <laughs> it could happen at any time. So, yeah, yeah. And I've had, since serving the device in, I've had two appropriate treatments, so, which is like where I've had a shock, where it's done its job, basically. My heart stepped out of line. It's given me a zap, and um, I'm back on. It's like a grenade going off in your chest. It's, uh, it's pretty, really? Yeah, it's, it's horrid. And it triggers itself? Right? Yeah, it does it itself. There's no warning. There's no, there's no like, countdown or anything. It just wallop. <laughs> Did you, but do you, so first time that happened, do you notice your heart getting faster? Or yeah, the first time I did because it, it happened, um, I'd had it in, in the October and I think it was the, no, it was a month later. So it wasn't even a month I'd had it. Um, and um, I, was, I was spending some time with the missus and I said, oh, hang on a sec. Um, my heart's going a little bit. And before I'd even reached for my uh, carotid pulse, I'd had the zap and I was on, the, on my ass on the bedroom floor <laughs> sort of thing, you know. But it's, it's just, it, it, it's incredibly violent, but it's instantaneous. It's over, you know, before you've kind of r- realized it. And the second one that was on the hills uh, in Brecon, uh, just uh, just coming up the shoulder of um, Corn D by Penavan, and I got another got a belt there. So, um, <laughs> yeah. But since then, I've had a couple of close calls, but I'm kind of getting better at uh, recognizing. Does it physically puts you on your backside. Oh yeah, it can do. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, while I was on Corn D, I felt it coming, so I kind of just grabbed the rock because you can lose consciousness. But um, thankfully, I've managed to sort of stay on my feet. But uh, it's it's just violent. It's it, it's. I can't remember. It's eight thousand volts local. It's quite quite serious. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not not nice. No. But where, where, where are you from originally? Nottingham. Nottingham. I'm going to say. I'm glad you're pronouncing corn D properly. Yeah. Well, my, my wife's Welsh speaker, and so are my kids. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I'd be getting slaughtered if I get that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when did you get in there? So, tw- rather is rather at twenty in twenty twelve. Yeah. So what, I joined. 90s. I joined as a junior leader, Royal Signals junior leader, in nineteen ninety one. Um, at Harrogate, did a year there as a boy soldier, and then um, just sort of trotted through up till when did I, 2013. I commissioned, I think. Yeah, and then I, I just left a couple of years after. You know, I'd, I kind of, I don't know, the stuff had been knocked out of it a bit. I'd run the race, and I was just like, you know, there's, there's more to life than this now. Mm. I was looking around at like some of the quartermaster jobs and some of the jobs I was going to be potentially going into, and some of the hoods that were in them. And I just thought, nah, you're all right, thanks. I don't want to end up like that. Let's pull this mic across in front of you for me. There you go. Yeah, right, yeah. cool. Um, I suppose when you get, not that I got to that level, but I suppose when you, when you get there, it's uh, I don't know. You either have to be in the mindset for desk job, mm-hmm. which probably W O two W one is mostly that anyway, isn't yeah. it? Um, but then as you go even higher, it's yeah, it's even more so as an LE anyway. Yeah. I don't think it was one of the things that the back of my mind. I I I. I left before I was pushed here in wise mm-hmm. and again it was it was it was the realization that I'm not gonna be able to deploy in the way I want to deploy in the teeth end never again yeah. you know I was still young it was like I'm 30 between sergeant and then it's can't do that, can't do yeah. that again, yeah it's mad it's like I'm the rug pull from under your feet I mean your situation was obviously a lot worse than mine because you were a lot younger but um, you know, I'd kind of I'd reached I'd done what I wanted to do you know I'd kind of I ticked all the boxes I'd had a really full career I'd, I'd gone down the roads which I wanted to go down, and I thought, right, I, I'm not going to look over my shoulder and think, I wish I had of woulda, shoulda, coulda. So I left completely satisfied. And um, <laughs> to be honest with you, I still speak to a lot of the blokes that are in, and I definitely made the right choice. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was probably going to leave anyway. I was yeah, just gonna yeah. be, just becoming a bit disillusioned with things, and mm. Afghan was finishing as well, and, and yeah. it was like, ah, what else am I going to do yeah. like that? So, so it was coming anyway. But. Um, I don't know. Now I look back and think, ah, man. Mm. I don't, don't get me wrong. Love my life where I'm at. Yeah, but yeah. Also, you always look at the different paths and go, ah, how much of the stress I've had. Just yeah. you know, even just things like the realization of how secure mm. that job is. Oh god, yeah. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. Oh my god. If you're unsure about what you're going to do and you're thinking about leaving, you're not sure if you want to leave or not. You yeah. don't know. You can walk straight. In, you don't think you can walk straight into a job. And don't don't leave. No. <laughs> it's, the, it's the easiest <laughs> money you'll ever make, isn't it? Really, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hardest thing to get sacked from. Yeah, you well, you've got to be special to get kicked out. Yeah, very special. Yeah, yeah. very special. Yeah, indeed, absolutely. Yeah. Where did um, you left in 2013? 15, 2015. I went. 20, sorry, yeah. 2015. You left. How long's breakfast been going for? So I left in 15, and um, I walked straight into a third sector charity job. I did that for a year. Um, which was really interesting. Complete diversion, you know, change of direction. And then I ended up as a practice manager at a large farm vets in Carmarthen, where I live. And I don't know, the, the job was okay, but I kept sort of 
thinking to myself, is it, am I going to be doing this for the next 20 years, you know, until I retire 25 years, you know, because 65 is the sort of average retirement age. And I don't know, there was a, there's just a sort of gap and I was thinking, I'm, I'm just not, this is not going to, I'm not going to stick this out. I'm not going to be able to do it. And I was coming home from the vets quite stressed out. Uh, it was a busy job, uh, a number of characters there that were making things a little bit difficult. Yeah, you know, you know the score. Um, but I was trying to do my best because that's what we do. We just knuckle down and get on, don't we? But um, my missus could see me deteriorating. And um, at sort of mid, mid-16, mid I was coming home and just plugging into YouTube just for a couple of hours just to sort of unwind and just take my head away from the job because it was constant. You know, the phone, text, it just wouldn't leave me alone. And... I just watched a clip of a, I think he was Russian. He may have been Eastern Bloc chap, I don't know, didn't speak English, but I imagine Lithuanian, maybe Czech, I'm not sure. And he made a knife in his garden out of an old saw blade. And he just had some sort of rudimentary tools. And I thought, well, that looks fun. I'll have a crack at that this weekend because I knew I had an old lawnmower blade in the shed. And my shed at that time is a, it's quite a big one. It's an 18 by 12, but it was like for bikes and just general repairs and stuff. So I cleared a bit of room on a bench and just went to town and I made this kind of Captain Caveman effort. But I enjoyed the process. And um, I think really what kicked it off was I thought oh, I wanted to harden the steel. And I knew the blade was already hardened, but I was thinking... And I'd done a little bit of stuff with a metalsmith a long, long time ago on a Bosnia tour. And he'd sort of taught me loosely about hardening metals, about you know heating them up and then quenching them in different mediums to get different hardnesses. And I wanted to kind of refresh that knowledge and just be a bit more competent at it. And I thought, you know, I was, at this point, I just thought I'll just do it for a bit of fun on the weekends. And, you know, as you start to delve into things, you pick up a few books, you start watching a few tutorials, and it sort of takes over and becomes a bit of a mania. And if I do something, I go into it, you know, really deep, 100%. And it just went from there. And that was in, goodness me, so back into 16. By mid-17, I'd sold a couple of mountain bikes that I could no longer ride because of my ticker to generate a bit of revenue to buy a, a proper designated knife grinder. So it has a 72-inch abrasive belt, which spins at a horrendous rate of knots. And that's what you use to sort of shape and form the metal. Um, because you can't really do it with... You can do it with DIY tools, but if you want to do it to any reasonable standard, you've got to have the right tools to do the job. So you essentially... Like, uh, like you're sanding it into, into the shape you want. Yeah, you so... The broad, you talk about the broad shape of the blade. Yeah. Yeah, and it, so yeah, I mean the, the the belt the belt runs like if you imagine like a belt sander, but it's it runs. If I stood up to it now, it would run down my chest. Excuse me, sorry, back in the mic. The belt would run down my chest, so it runs towards you, and yep. you have a small table, and then you can you can shape, you can profile. Um, you know, you, I mean, learning those methods is, is a time-consuming thing all on its own. Um, but I, I didn't have anything else to do, and you know I wanted to make sure it, I wanted to do it properly. So I just took the time and practiced and practiced and practiced. And one thing leads on to another. Failure is you know the ultimate teacher, and I've I've got a bucket full of knives that I've cocked up. You know even now I make the odd mistake, you know, but I look back now and I think crikey, you know I wouldn't even dream about doing that now. But it's like building up that muscle memory, building up that confidence, knowing the materials, you know what what makes them tick and how they work, and just sort of working through those things. And you either commit to it and do it or you know you don't were you were you arty crafty that kind of diy skilled before i'm uh, 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 pretty handy with tools and stuff like that but definitely not arty i couldn't i can't draw for toffee i'm terrible uh, my wife's a fantastic artist so that that sort of compliment she comes up with a vision and i usually put it into practice ah. um not with the knives so much but you know if it's in the house she'll visualize something and then <laughs> you know i'll be on my hands and knees making it happen <laughs> visualize the yeah uh, exactly. the, the hoover, the yeah. hoover uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> every day yeah <laughs> when did you th when did you th realize you could turn it into a business then I think I'd gotten to the point with the, the, the management job in the vets. Um, by the back end of 2017, I'd made a couple of nice nice knives, which I thought were of a reasonable quality. And I'd just on the quiet showed them to a couple of friends, and they'd gone flipping out. I'll have a, I'll have a pair of those. My boys, like you know, and I was like, ooh. You know, I, I, then it starts to get a bit worrying because your product's leaving your hand then, so it's going to be under scrutiny mm. from someone else. You know, is it going to hold up to the job? Because I know the people they're going to, they're not going to hold back. They're going to be splitting wood. They're going to be chopping, you know, cutting and doing like real stuff. Now, I know fundamentally what I've done to that blade makes it, you know, robust enough to do those jobs. But the first couple that go out, you do twitch a little bit and you've, you're, you're waiting for that feedback. But um, I just sent them to the friends, you know, I, I gave them away for beans, really did because I wasn't sure at that point you know what to charge for my work or materials or anything so I sent a few out um, and then I started doing a bit of leather work as well because obviously they need to come with a sheath of some description um, and that was a, a kind of gross 
underestimation of how much work and time and effort that was going to take. So the, the leather work is, is worse than the metal. It's, really? it's, oh, it's totally unforgiving. You make a mistake with the <laughs> it's honestly, it's ruthless. One mistake with the leather and it's in the scraps. There's no, you can't sort of correct it. You mark it or mar it, it's gone. It's done, finished. Where are you sourcing all where you, oh, no, I'm away from the mic now. Jesus, that's all right. That. Where, where are you sourcing the materials from? Because I think I know it's on the website, the, the wood locally sourced. Yeah, right? so yeah. I, can, I can get a, like, basically a log. As long as it's not been saturated, I can take it, prepare it into planks or you know, to, to workable size timber, and I'll, I'll work that down to the size of um, material that I need to put the handles on. So I've got Welsh oak, Welsh walnut. And people just send me stuff, you know, like blokes will be cutting a tree down in their garden and say, I've got this, this ash or this yew tree, do you want some, or olive or whatever. And I don't need a gross amount to make just a couple of knives or if I get big chunks of it. And anything that I need that's a little bit um, a little bit fancy, if you like, like Coca Bolo, some of the tropical woods, South Americans, I'll order online. And I've got a couple of really good suppliers who sort of, I say it's ethically sourced. It's not it's not chopped down in the rainforest, you know, it's, it's already been felled and stored away somewhere and it's then... I don't know, it's, it, it arrives in a, in a manner that is not um, dubious, if you like, um, because some of the woods, lignum vitae and a few of the other tropics, they're quite hard to get hold of, um, and you have to be careful where they're sourced because you can get into a little bit of trouble. So, so how do you go about validating that then? Well, I mean, I have to trust the integrity of the guy I'm buying it from, and obviously their reputation is at risk as well, So you know, it's uh, and, and their business, to be honest with you. So, um, you, you know, they, they're all regulated by the FSC and a few of the other sort of governing bodies with the woods and things like that, so... I know obviously synthetics as well is another thing. So some people don't want natural wood handles. So I use G10, which is a resin glass fiber composite. Yeah. Um, multiple colors in that as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's like a really hard, dense uh, material, which is impervious to everything. So if I was making a knife for the Arctic or something like that, that would be an ideal material to choose for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's, yeah, that's a good point about the wood, actually. Because... Um, one of the one of the things we realised recently is getting decent wood is rock rocking or shit. Yeah. So we I say we combat cigars. We we started making um, humidors out of ammo tins, right? We're about <laughs> to, we're about to, we're about to put one on, online, but we line we line the inside of the tin with um, it sounds simple, but it's not. You like well, the process is simple, but it's sourcing the woods not. We line the inside of the tin with um, Spanish cedar or yeah, African yeah. cedar, mm-hmm. just because of the the um, properties of well, you know. More yeah, cedar. Yes, yeah, so rock proof. Yeah. Yeah, trying to get that stuff mm-hmm. in sheet form. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then you find it, and you're paying through your yeah, eyeballs. Absolutely. For the wood. Unbelievable. And we, well, just as an example, we found one one reliable stockist in the whole of the UK. Yeah. And when he runs out, we're screwed. Yeah. I yeah. used to uh, try and be clever about it and go back to source. So just sort of like um, try and see where they're getting it from. You know, um, cedar's a very predominant Canadian wood. So someone out there somewhere will be doing it. You've just got to sort of dig around and, you know, maybe I'll have to have a chat offline afterwards. What do you mean it's, what do you mean it's a prominent Canadian wood? Well, you've got to go where it grows um, and it'll be in abundance. And someone somewhere in, that, I'm sure cedar, um, I'm saying that, as a guy I watch on YouTube, Samurai Carpenter, he uses a lot of cedar and he's Vancouver Island. So, you know, it's got coming from where he's at. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think so. When we were when we were researching the materials for the for, for the humidor, yeah, it's Spanish and African is the go to for it. Right, other, okay, yeah, interesting. So, so that's why we use the Spanish and African. Okay, whereas other types of cedar yeah. don't have as good properties. Now, the Spanish the is, Spanish will be easy to get hold of, I'm sure, because it's. I mean, you could fly out the there. Same, yeah, but, uh, uh, yeah, good, good, I suppose. Yeah, but yeah. both from the same supplier. Yeah, but okay, it's a good point though, because I mean, I wonder how much difference there is in the quality. It could be marginal. It yeah. could be fractional. Right? Or it could be that no one's used it before for whatever reason because it's on the other side of the world, but it'll still do the same job at maybe a third of the cost. Who knows? Mm. You know, I did that on my leather. I, um, I, was, I was sourcing it through a company in the UK, but I was paying through the nose, and then someone said, oh, you know, you can get that from X, Y, and Z over in Italy, direct. You know, I was like, hmm. So obviously, you know, you buy a few more than you normally would, but the saving overall is huge. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll have to have a look at this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, What's the what have, you, what have you had any strange requests, custom custom requests? Um, I imagine you have. I have, I especially <laughs> with the, especially with that extended network of yours. <laughs> <and parapets. laughs> yeah, I, mainly uh, yeah. I've had a couple of sort of people who are very specific, like down to the millimeter of where they want certain things, which is fine because that knife is being produced for a certain purpose. And uh, Nick, Gold, w- Nick Goldsmith, Benny Jones? yeah, Nick Goldsmith at Hidden Valley. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was two years in the making. Yeah, yeah, but I mean. That was that was a great process to go through with Nick because uh, yeah people will assume because I'm a knife maker I'm a fantastic knife user I'm actually not you know I, I I know I understand the materials and I make good knives 
but uh, as a user, I'm a kind of intermediate. I'm an average bushcrafter. You know, I can I can do a little bit of Ray Mearsy stuff, but I'm no Nick. You know, so Nick took those prototypes, and that's why it was so long in, in the making, because if things weren't quite right, we'd come up with a bit more feedback. And it was silly little things, but as a user, over a day, a week, a month, you know, the fatigue, you know, the sort of wear on the hands, uh, the different um, techniques that he was using um, to, to do tasks were taking a toll on different parts of the blade, different parts of the edge. So, you know, we sort of narrowed that down, and at times it was incredibly frustrating but we got there in the end and we feel now that we have got the ultimate bushcraft tool and in, and they are down to the millimeter you know there's seven centimeters from the, the spine to the tip and it's there for a particular reason there's no space between the front of the handle and the the beginning of the um, the cutting edge because you want the maximum amount of area there's a tab on the back for scraping skin and bark so you don't have to dull the blade while you're doing it you know, i know you told me all about the tab you yeah about the tab. yeah so i mean and <laughs> the, the handle profile we're down to like you know the millimeter, so you know I've got a, I've got a, a template which I've got up above my grinder, and each handle is done to exactly the same thing. I use a micrometer to measure them so that every knife is exactly the same. Uh, well, okay. I say exactly the same, you know, within a millimeter. But you're crafting the handles as well, right? Yeah, everything. Yeah. Tim, so, but how are you doing that then? If you know good with a knife, it must uh, be, there must be some skill there. Yeah, there is. I mean, obviously, use the grinder, um, different abrasive belts, and different methods to take that material off. But it goes down to hand files and paper at the end of the day. So you know, that's I've I've tried to refine and um, make the process as easy on myself as I can. But there are just no shortcuts. You've just got to put the hours in and be good and effective at what you do with with the knife. So. You know, once once I've stuck the, the handles on, you know, essentially that's what you do. You stick them on with a. I've got to use a marine grade, marine grade epoxy called uh, G Flex. It's a real strong stuff. Is that with the red? No, that's the liner. So the liner goes. If you imagine the tang of the knife, which is the steel that goes right the way through the blade, yeah. each side of the the steel, you can have a liner, which you've got on your knife there. And that's just for aesthetic. Yeah, aesthetics, purpose. and it gives you a little bit of shock absorption as well if you were really going to town. Oh, really? Yeah. So there's a couple of different materials that I use for that. G10, which is a kind of a resin uh, and glass fiber thing, which is colored. And I also use um, a vulcanized f fiber gasket, which is kind of submarine hatch seal. What's vulcanized? Uh, something to do with um, hardening and, and making rubber. You know, they vulcanize tires, don't they? I don't know the science of it. But it's, it's kind of... When you put it under pressure, it's watertight, so that that gives you uh, you know a little bit more flexibility as well. And if the wood, sometimes even though the wood has been seasoned and it's been oiled, there's a little bit of flexibility in there. So let's say, for instance, if you were going out to Namib Namibia, I would suggest to you that you don't take you know a wooden handled knife because it's so arid out there and dry, it will suck every last drop of moisture out of that knife, and there's likelihood that it could peel back. You know, the knife would still be effective, but, you know, you've got risk of, you know, pinching your hand or, you know, catching a scale or whatever. So I'd, I'd suggest to the user or the client that we use a synthetic for that. And I've got a range of synthetics, different weights and things like that. So, you know, over the years I've been doing it now, we can pretty much come up with a plan for any any sort of environment and any knife. And I think the clients, they enjoy a little bit of interaction with that, you, you know, taking my advice and experience with their own needs and their wants. And we kind of meet halfway and we often sort of bounce off each other and get come up with a really good product. That's essentially what I'm trying to provide, really. What about parangs and stuff like that? Yeah, I've done a few. Um, obviously, I did a fair bit of time in the jungle myself. So having used one, uh, I've got a couple of Louio's parangs. Louio's sadly passed away now. So he used to make them uh, out in um, Satang um, for the blokes. And um, Who, Who's that, sorry? Louio, he's an Eban guy. Um, so um, when Selection went out to the trees, uh, Louio is one of the local Eban guys that used to look after the the, the training team out there. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, he used to make the parangs, and he just made them out of road leaf springs, and then he would he would melt down lighters and pour them into the handle material and let them sort of dry off. So you know they're very crude, but they were good tools. You know, and essentially the the best tools are always the simplest ones. So I've got a couple of his original ones, one that I bought myself when I was out there, and and one that someone else gave me as well. So I've got a good reference point for a, you know a working sort of parang, and I've got my own ideas as well. Um, so I've kind of again met halfway so I've got essentially I'm at the point now where if you can conceive an idea uh, or a shape a size a dimension a width or a depth I can make it out of steel and we can sort of go from there but if someone comes in with something really wild I'll say well you know the balance between the handle and the length of that blade is not going to work for x y and z but ultimately at the end of the day if the client wants that particular knife then I'll make it for them 
it, with or without my advice, it's not not a problem. <laughs> How thin can you go with the blades? Um, you can go down to sort of sort of fillet in width, which is like is that, two, is that two, 25 mil. That's four mil. That is so four mil. Across 25, the, like two and a half mil. <laughs> 25 mil. No, that's four millimeter. That is so four millimeter o tool steel. So the thinnest I use is uh, a two mil, which is for filleting knives, for you know filleting fish and the like. A two mil stainless. Yeah, but I, I mean, once I've ground it down to the edge, it's you know, you're sort of sub one eighth of a mil or whatever else it is. It's down to a carbide's kind of, you know, microscopic level. And that's what the edge is essentially is a, you know, so it's, it's a fine wire um, of carbide and um, of steel on the edge. Do you find it a cathartic experience now? As in m beneficial? Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, I'm not in it to, you know, make millions or whatever else. It's a time consuming and, labor intensive job and there's no real way of speeding it up it is what it is but i'm happy at the end of the day when i take that product and i think right it's finished now and i've applied everything that i've known and i've learned into into making it you know and i've kind of i don't i don't have a kind of that'll do you know that'll do won't do attitude you know so if it's not right it just doesn't go out it's as simple as that so i'll take as long as it takes and you know people do get frustrated because i do i do slip past deadlines but at the end of the day when they get their knife i've never had anybody come back to me and say oh well, that wasn't worth the wait you know, it's just it just takes an incredible amount of time. I'm at the stage now where I've got probably en enough orders. I've got, you know, I've got enough, and I could probably take somebody on. But in doing that, I'm kind of there's a little bit of me that doesn't want to do it because I don't want to dilute the product because it's my knife, my product, and I don't really want anybody else having hands on it. And that's really why I've kept the premises on at, at my home because I didn't want it going anywhere else if you like you know never it doesn't leave the the, the workshop once it once the steel comes in and I or I forge or I or I start shaping it that's it so it's hardened it's tempered it's heat treated everything is done in house all the leather the lot never leaves the the premises and then it's popped into its box you know and I know that I've done my level best to to make and provide you know the best tool that I possibly can for that for that person mm. yeah but definitely when you talk about you know cathartic and sort of Therapeutic, yeah. For me, it is, yeah, definitely. I suppose you switch off, don't it, right? It's concentration. Totally. A little bit of a form of meditation, maybe. Yeah, you know, I just kind of just drift off into it, you know. And I've I've done I've done enough now that I know exactly what, where, and when. And I just I just kind of just go through it, you know. Um, and I suppose really, again, with experience, little things that used to bother me or used to be a real sort of stumbling block, you know, certain parts of the process, because I've done them so many times now, they're kind of second nature. But I'm I'm starting to give that back now. So if I'm sort of coming across younger makers and newer makers, and I'm more than happy to share my experiences with them. Some makers are quite sort of knowledge incentric; they kind of keep it to themselves. But at the end of the day, if, if, you know, if someone's got a little bit about them, they'll just go onto YouTube and they'll and they'll find it out over. If one person's saying ten percent of it, they'll go elsewhere for sixty, and then another thirty, and they've got their hundred percent of what they need. Whereas well, I'll just say to the guy or, or who or the girl, you know, this is what I do. It's just, just my method, but it works for me. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share anything with anybody. It's quite a small community, the knife make community. Yeah, I suppose so, really. I mean, UK-wise, I mean, America is huge. They've got the Bladesmith Society. They've got, a, a, you know, a program for pushing people through the journeyman smith and the master smith. We haven't got that in the UK. Uh, blacksmiths do. They have a blacksmiths guild, but blacksmiths don't just make knives. So, I don't know, maybe in the future, there's been a few sort of, diluted attempts at starting things in the UK but they kind of run out of momentum or there's a personality clash and people just buckle down and that's the end of that you know so I don't know it's not something I I haven't got I haven't really got time no I don't think any knife maker's got time to start something like that to be honest that's that's probably the problem what about um automation sorry what about automation uh, what making knives through an automatic process yeah yeah has that got a risk of killing the killing the art off I don't think so um you can go and buy a good off-the-shelf knife, you know, a good quality off-the-shelf knife, but people are more endeared and more drawn to a handmade artisan piece, you know, that they know has had a bit of love, a bit of genuine sort of integrity and and, and honesty poured into it, you know, and um, that they know that I've stood there and spent 36, 37 hours making that knife for them, you know, it's for them, it's a, it's a personal thing. And if you make them right, then they go on to another generation you know fathers to sons sons to daughters so on and so forth um so that that's that's my feeling if you want a knife that you you know you you want to go and i don't know slap on your belt kit and crawl around in the crap with go and buy a gerber 
no drama. And if you lose it, it's not the end of the world. If you break it, you can get another one for 50 quid. But if you want something that's going to really endure, really last, and you know you can fully trust, buy a handmade knife. Mm. Yeah. No, you're right. I, lo I love this, by the way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking my kids ain't getting this. <laughs> No, yeah. No, you're right. No, you're absolutely right. It's something it's something to be said you know, across a, a bunch of different industries and stuff like this where it's the it's the personal touch. But then oh, you don't want to pass that knowledge on. I mean, you've got the one, that, like bringing someone on, you've got the one aspect is growth, mm -hmm. able to be able mm -hmm. to deliver more products, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the other side is that, not, yeah, handing that knowledge on, right? So it yeah. continues, I know. continues when that. I've started writing a book. So um, I, it's not going to die with me. Um, so yeah, I was on holiday a couple of years back and I just wanted to, I suppose, consolidate my knowledge because I'm still occasionally, not so much nowadays, but I'm still mindful that I could check out, you know, quite quickly if, uh, if things go peak tong. So I just wanted to um, have it down, I suppose, really. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a big kind of Moleskine type book, which I just kind of vomit my ideas onto. Yeah. Um, so I've got the process from sort of flash to bang. And um, I, I've started thinking about perhaps doing um you know a self-release uh kindle book yeah um but so is it, sorry is the book on knife making yeah it would it? just be about my, my process and you know my procedures on how to do it and I, I, what i've sort of i think maybe you know it's kind of like lifting the lid on it really so i'm not going to hold back and sort of you get a lot of books that they give you like 80 percent of the of the gen and you have to sort of like suss the rest out yourself and it's kind of like it's not it's not a trade secret you know <laughs> if you're going to share something then share it all don't hold back because I, I, I mean, I, I, my ethos is, you know, if you've got the knowledge then share it, you know, everybody should sort of benefit from it. So, you know, that's, that's, that's what I want to do really. And there were some classes maybe next year as well. I want to do maybe getting some blokes in and doing a, you know, some bushcraft, bushcraft knife um, sort of tutorials, if you like, you know, for people that want to make their own knife. Um, but the book, yeah, I think, um, you know, the knowledge will, will definitely, um, you know, won't die with me. It'll get, it'll, it'll be out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, self-publishing. Yeah. The I saw you self-publish a book. Piece of piss. The only problem with self-publishing is, well, you probably don't you research yourself is that getting the marketing out there. Yeah. And when I uh, I interviewed Chris Cox, mm -hmm. uh, Fire Force author, you know the RLI. Right. Yeah. Okay. So th him and his missus, they've got a they've got a a publishing company. Ah. Okay. But it's they call it a hybrid. So it's this new model of publishing mm, companies. Okay. It's a hybrid. So it's a mix between self-publishing and the marketing side. So they'll which is basically cheaper than going with a full full publisher, yeah. but um, they do it all through Amazon, like I did, you know, Creative yeah. Space and all that. But they throw in a marketing piece and a whole strategy, getting your getting your book out there. So you've got because you know with a, with a normal book publisher, you there's, there's, there's often quite an outlay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted like e path of least resistance. Yeah. You know, basically edit it, get it so it's digestible and readable. You know, um, my missus is. She's been awesome right through the whole process, and I've got to give her a mention because she is fearsome. You know, right from the beginning when I was a, uh, I'm just going to sort of go go back right to the beginning. So when I was at the vets, I'm sort of coming yeah. way off track here. Yeah. I was having a bad day, a really bad day, and um, one of the geezers was talking to me, and I was just basically just I just blanked out. I was looking out the window watching the grass getting cut, and I just thought I'm not sitting here doing this anymore. So I said, I'll stop you there. I said, give me a minute. I just need to go make a phone call. So he's like looking at me, gone out. So I went down the stairs, phoned the missus, and said, right. I said. I've just had an earful. I, I, I can't do this anymore. And she went, right. She goes, no, fuck them. She goes, grab your stuff, clear your desk and walk. She goes, just come home. We'll make it work. You know, and, and she has been. Legend. Oh, uh, yeah, she is, honestly. You know, so Gail, you know, big shout out. And the kids as well. Uh, they have stood behind me right from the word go, you know. So, I mean, it wouldn't have flown without her, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, go on back with the vets. Yeah, go on. Uh, shout out Gail and the kids. <laughs> um, did any like anything to do with animals previous no. experience? No, apart from stroking dogs. And no, no, I was a pra I was a practice manager, so I was just managing vets, yeah. you know, which is like, yeah, it's impossible. So, yeah, they're a strange breed. Are they stranger than doctors? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We'll stop. It. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> they're more expensive. I know that. Fucking vets, hideously, hideously expensive. Yeah, hideously expensive. Um, you you got you you think about including any, any ever doing anything on your middle career book wise. No. Experiences like that, no. no. Well, wow, that was a very firm no. No, it? Gail's always saying to me, oh, you should, you know, because all your dits and all the rest of it. But I think it's been done with that picking up the brass and you know, there's a few other books that are of that nature, aren't they? You know, sort of like spinning dits and talking crap about, you know, guard mount and all that sort of malarkey. Yeah, you know, it's all a bit, uh, so not for me, I don't think. 
Yeah, that's yeah. fair enough. I think it's, it's hard these days. Yeah. Like probably a lot of people will have a, I think they have a nothing. They want to do a have a want to do a book and have a book in them. Yeah. Um I think if depends what it's for, doesn't it? Yeah. If you've gone on an ego exercise, don't bother doing it. No. Nah. If you if you're gonna get something like cathartic from it, yeah. Do it, I think. Yeah, I think if if it's self if it's self healing and you know, providing a bit of therapy, then do it, yeah. And you don't have to publish it. You've just written it all down. It's good it's a good it's a good exercise just to sort of get it all on paper, isn't it? You know. That's a good point. You don't have to don't have to publish no, it. No, uh, not at all. Uh, no, not at all. So I started writing my book, like sort of the, the knife book, like four years ago now, when I just started, because I wanted to sort of capture the process, you know, when I, when I, but about a year into it, I think, and I thought, right, I know enough now to be able to write some stuff down. And then I started again a bit more last year, doing it on the computer. So I've kind of got it on in draft now. So I've got kind of two bodies of work, which I need to kind of merge and then form one big thing. So we'll just see how that goes. But, um, manual type of book yeah or? i suppose so yeah and, and and the reason i go back to the missus is she'll probably do the artwork for it so just kind of because a lot of the things they need a pictorial um piece because trying to explain you know bevel angles and um different things you know you need a pictorial guide so that you know all oh, right okay i get it because i know i'd be sitting there going well that's all well and good but what does that look like you know so i think um the the sort of art side of things will be quite key but because she's so good, I know she'll just quickly sketch some stuff up, which will, you know, make my point clear, but without being too complex and um, costing me the earth with colours and detail and things. So, you know, I think simple is always best, isn't it? You know, with everything, really. Yeah, definitely. Well, and what's the aim with it? You want to you want to help people who are amateurs or yeah, I guess. aspiring? Yeah, And no, it'd be nice to get a bit of revenue from it. I'm not going to lie, you know, because, um, you know, I think it's quite a niche a niche area. I know when you search um, knife making books on uh, Kindle, there's like three. So, you know, because it's not a really sort of popular subject per se, but those three people have done very well out of it. So I suppose if you can offer something different, and I've looked at their style, and although it does give you the information, there's a lot left to you to kind of work out, whereas I think I'm going to be a little bit more in detail, a little bit more in depth. So, I mean, there are there are different lots of different things I could do. I could do like a basic, then a kind of advanced, and then a, a sort of, you know, uh, almost like a master or journeyman level, you know, where you've got a bit of basic foundation knowledge of tools and, and methods and, and process, and you can sort of go to the next step almost. So like a, you know, one, two or three levels, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it goes. If I wanted to make a knife now, mm. apart from the, the materials, yeah. the metal, the handle, if it's wood, whatever, minimum kit needed yeah. for me to go into my shed mm. and lock up a knife. Tell me. You need a, a metal file to be able to remove the material and shape the, the blade. You need a vise, definitely. I started a tutorial package on YouTube about this last year, but with everything that went on with COVID and a few other things going on in my life, it's sort of stalled. But I will pick it up again because we're on kind of like number three. But you need a file, a vise, a drill with a metal drill bit, uh, some epoxy resin, and lots and lots of sandpaper. And you could do it quite comfortably. You better make a knife in a day. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ah, actually, the, the the only stumbling point would be hardening and tempering it. But if you had uh, a specific sort of steel, uh, I don't want to get too geeky with you now, but D two or ten ninety five, which is a very simple carbon steel, you could heat that with a pair of blow torches, and you could quench it in cooking oil, and that would be sufficient enough to make the knife hard. And then the tempering process is just basically warming the knife through. So I always use a conventional oven for that anyway. So at 200 degrees in a normal oven. Well, what's tempering? <laughs> yeah, okay. I saw, your, I saw that interest level peak then. So <laughs> when, when, when you take an annealed piece of steel, which is basically as it comes from the factory, so it's, it's not hardened, it's just in its normal state. So you've got, let's just use a normal carbon steel. So you've got iron and carbon in that steel. When you heat the steel up to a cherry red color, what's called upper critical, the molecules are released within that steel and they start to move around in what's called solution. So they're floating around in the steel. It's not liquid, it's just that all the molecules are moving around. And what you want to do when you're hardening the steel is you want to try and capture them um, in that different molecular state so that they don't return to their normal state. So you're kind of shocking them, if you like, and you're catching them. It's like, it's like grabbing hold of something really tight, you know, it kind of locks into that position. So when you quench a hot knife into oil, it freezes it into what's called martensite, um, which is a, another state of um, molecular structure so you've gone from annealed to martensite um, which is like a gray color and the knife at that point is hardened and it's very brittle 
Um, so people say, oh, if you drop a, a hardened knife onto the floor, you know, it's got a likelihood of shattering. It's very unlikely, but if, let's say, I dropped it onto a tiled floor. Imagine a, a hand file now, yeah? Mm -hmm. if, if anybody's ever tried to use a hand file as a lever or a screwdriver, they tend to snap because they're brittle, but they're very hard because they can take material off of softer metals. So when I harden a knife, it's in that kind of state that a file is in. Um, so tempering, <clears throat> you put it into a conventional oven, and all you're doing is you are reducing the brittleness, but you're giving it strength. So I would take a knife that I have heated up, quenched in oil, and then just let cool until it's hand holdable. I'll then pop it into a, just a normal toaster oven. It's like a little Black & Decker student oven I've got in my workshop. I'll throw it in there, <laughs> not literally, just pop it onto the shelf, 200 degrees for two hours, and then I let it cool, and then I do it again. So I do two cycles at 200 degrees, and that knife then is tempered to a certain hardness on what's called the Rockwell scale. Now I know that the knife you've got in front of you there sits at about 59 Rockwell. So it's hard enough to be a good tool, but it's soft enough and workable enough for you to be able to put an edge on there without you know, any particular skill. So it's the perfect medium between the two. Yeah, okay, because Nick, when I was down in the bushcraft, Nick was talking to me about this, about the different, uh, I forgive me, I can't remember every, every deal. Yeah, but, of course, yeah. But the difference between <coughs> the different, obviously different metals, yeah. some are easier to sharpen than others. Some, some of them, there's not even any point in trying to sharpen them. No. For example, your kitchen knife off the shelf in Tesco's. Yeah. It's like, no, ever bother trying to take a, no. a, 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 um, a sharpening stone to that. No. It's just... just yeah, no you point. may as well. It's like a, like a one-time use thing. You, you know, if you're going to spend three quid on a kitchen knife, you're going to get three quid's worth of value. You know, so yeah, it's um, every steel has its own little little nuances, little ways it needs to be treated. Like I've got I've got a range of it's, it's called a recipe, you know, a heat treating recipe. So the one that I've got there is 800 degrees. I hold it for a certain amount of time, then I ramp it up to 815 degrees. I hold it for a certain amount of time. It comes out, then it gets quenched in oil, and then it goes into the uh, to temper an oven. The steel that we use for Nick's knife, the Hidden Valley knife, is a Nylox, which is a stainless steel. It's a lot harder, and it, its carbide content is higher. It's got chromium in there, magnesium, magnesium. It's, it, there's loads of other ingredients in the steel. That needs to go up to 1,050 degrees, and it also needs to be put into a foil pouch so that it doesn't oxidize in the kiln. There's a real science to it, you know, and I didn't have a clue when I started this. So I was like, what on earth is going on? Oh, where did you learn stuff like that, though? Just you watching watching chaps on YouTube. Chemistry, yeah. yeah, and just, well, yeah, it's physics, isn't it? It's berserk. But um, I just thought, well, you know, it started somewhere. Someone had to cock it up once or twice to get going. So let's just do the same thing. So I did. I've, like I say, my bucket of fails at the, at the initial part of it. It was, it was getting deeper and deeper. And I thought, right, I've, I'm doing something wrong. You know, something, something's not working out right. And all it was, that I had the wrong type of oil. I was quenching it in the wrong oil. Oh, I had the temperature on the kiln not quite hot enough. You know, so you just go back to the drawing board and just burn the midnight oil until you get it right. And as soon as you've got a couple of successes, um, you know, you start to build a bit of confidence and, you know, you talk to other people. And like I say, five people won't tell you anything, but one person will share with you. And then it's like, ah, oh, right, now I understand. You know, so I'm trying to be that fifth person or sixth person. So if anybody ever asks me anything about heat treatment recipes, I go, yeah, there, there it is. I'll, I'll text it to you. Oh, right, thanks, great. You know, it's, it's no, it's no, so it's a black art. It's not, it's just, you just, you know, you've either put the legwork in or you don't. And I'd rather make it easy for someone. They're still going to have to spend the money on the equipment. So don't, you know, why make it difficult for them? No, no. I agree. Yeah. Uh, why does it have to be oil that you, that you, that you cool it in? It's, um, it's a rapid enough quench that it hardens a steel, but it's not aggressive. So it doesn't shatter. So if I was to do it in water, it would cool it too quickly and it would be super brittle. So when I tempered it then, I'd only be going back to, let's say, if I'm doing yours in oil, I've quenched yours in oil and I've tempered it to 200 degrees and we've got a 59 Rockwell blade. If I did it in water, it would cool a lot quicker. So it'd probably be at 100 uh, on the Rockwell scale before I tempered it. And then if I tempered it back, it'd be 80. So it'd still be very brittle. So water is just too quick a medium. So oil is a, uh, it's, it, it's fast enough, but it's, it's, it's delicate enough that it cools it down at the right rate. How high does the Rockwell scale go up? Do you know what? I don't know. Uh, probably to about, I'd say, oh, I mean, gosh, probably over the 70s, I think. 70, and, 70 to and 80. And that's the density of the metal, It's right? the hardness the of hardest. the metal, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, a, an average bushcraft knife ranges between 58 and 62 Rockwell, but I've definitely seen knives harden to 64 for different tasks. So if you wanted like a pure, just a chopping knife, you know, a 64 Rockwell convex grind, which would need next to no maintenance but that's all it will be able to do you know like axe style but it, it'd be harder to get a, 
harder to get it sharp, but you'd have to sharpen it less. Yeah, it'd be an, almost impossible to get an edge on that with any conventional tool. Really? Yeah, but think about how hard that steel is going to be. It'd be it'd be brutal to get an edge on. I'll tell you a, a, a very quick example of this. is um, I made a kitchen knife for me, and I did it to 61 Rockwell because I wanted it hard enough to be able to do all sorts of things, you know, working against bones, cutting vegetables, and all the rest of it. Now, the knife is very fine. It's very thin. It's very balanced. But when I was sharpening it on my normal knife steel, which is made of steel, the steel was softer. So my knife flattened the steel out. <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking, this is not working. I can't get an edge. And I was like, ah, the knife steel is harder than the steel. So there are different grades. So I bought a diamond one. Boom, Bob's your uncle. Because diamonds will obviously, you know, sh harder than metal. But they're not cheap. So not, not everybody's going to go out and spend 80 quid on a knife steel. Or the easy option for me is just to make it slightly softer. Because I've got the ability to do that. How do you how do you test what they're at? Um, I've got a Rockwell tester. How does that work? Oh, <laughs> right. Well, I don't know the internal sciences of it, but there's a machine where I put the the, the blade in. So I do one in five. Um, I put it under load. So there's you, you do one in five. Oh, one, one in five. One, blades. one in five blades. Yeah, okay, because yeah, yeah. it would be it be you know it wouldn't yeah, be yeah. you know effective to do them all. So uh, that batch has been treated in the same nature. So one, one out of those five will come out go into the Rockwell tester. So there's a small um, testing bit which has got a diamond on the tip and that um, is pressed against the steel and then it's done under load and there are a number of counterweights and springs in the back uh, it works on pressure as well um, and it actually leaves like a small dimple in the steel so that's the the only evidence that it's been rock well tested um, on the blade so there's no damage at all um, and that tells me that um, it's at the perfect one but I can almost guess now you know if I've if I've done everything correctly I've, I've heated it in the kiln at the right temperature i've used the same oil to quench it i've waited the same amount of time for the temper i can pretty much guarantee that it's going to be 59 you know and, and i can if i if i leave it to maybe just do one tempering cycle instead of two then i can say it's going to be 60 to 61 so with the parangs i do that because they need to be a little bit more robust so again it's just it's just going through it a number of times and just working out that sort of mid ground and, and what what works and what doesn't yeah how big are, how big are the parangs you're making um well, I'm just doing one at the moment, which is a, a custom job. So that's 10 inches from the, the sort of front oh. of the handle to the tip because he wanted it a little, a little bit smaller. Smart, yeah. yeah, so 13 to 14. But again, any size that, that people want, really. So, you know, standard size, I think, is about 12 and a half inches cutting edge, um, tip, to, tip to pommel, and then, uh, sorry, tip to, to, to choil, and then a handle of a good four inches with, you know, a nice bit of uh, a bite on it so you can get a good handle on there, you know. A lot of the, a lot of the native um, parangs have a smooth varnished handle, which is not particularly good because you um, obviously a sweaty hand, you know, sliding around. The last thing you want to be doing is sliding forward onto that cutting edge because you know you're down to the bone in a second. So I tend to use synthetics and I texture the synthetic so that it's got a bit more grip. Um, just something that I've I've worked out and people have used them and said, yeah, no, that works really well. It doesn't take anything away from the knife, but you've got extra security and that kind of last thing you want to be worrying about is how you're gripping the knife when you're chopping through, you know, secondary jungle, yeah, or, or trees and stuff. Yeah, I I got a. Uh Went out to Uganda, jungle training, hmm. and that was, we got local, I'd say, I'd say, we said parangs, they weren't parangs, these things are flipping machetes, they were massive, yeah. I mean, we're talking, the blade was like a foot and a half. Yeah, big long slopper, yeah. Yeah, and the idea was a bunch of guys' idea was, we'll just get out there, we'll get up prangs and if it comes out and it was just comical yeah. I ended up with my own prang out there which was <coughs> just nice smaller yeah. probably, probably about 10 11 inches actually yeah. but um, those things were crazy and just rust rusted immediately <laughs> yeah a lot of the, the that, but that, that's carbon steel does rust very quickly so even though it, rusty people say oh it's crap it's rusty it, it's, it's, it's just got a high carbon content that's what, that's what it is really so it doesn't necessarily mean it's poor it's just not got very good um, corrosion resistance so so how do you how do you how do you treat a knife to prevent it corro corroding like that? Well, obviously, <clears throat> keep it um, keep it clean and dry if you can. But um, a carbon steel, uh, uh, let's say a medium grade carbon steel like the one you've got in your hand there, that's an O1 tool steel, which is a nice quality steel. So that will take on a natural patina of its own lifetime anyway. So if you just leave that to in the air, like anything, it will oxidize over time. So it will take on a grey blue sort of colour. Um, you can if you leave it out, you know, and you leave it wet, that it will rust. Simple as that. So just a lick of oil when you're finished. Any oil? Yeah, any oil, any oil will do, even olive oil. You know, but three-in-one yeah. three, three in one machine oil is fine. You know, you get different oils that are a little bit more persistent. They stick on the surface. You get lots of these funky waxes and stuff. WD-40, it's better than anything, to be honest with you. Okay. You know, just slap a bit of that on there or, or a bit of three-in-one, you know, lawnmower oil. It's ideal. What about handle? Um, again, because it's wood, that'll be, um, if you can use some sort of, you know, something that's readily available to use, some flour oil, vegetable oil, olive, oil, olive oil, yeah. And if you, you know, if you want to go to town, get some boiled linseed. 
that's what's on there now. So I soak them for 12 hours in bored linseed and turpentine, and it sort of penetrates the wood and then, uh, you know, gets right in there. But uh, over time, you know, they will, you know, obviously in use, you, you'll get little dry spots and stuff. But that's part of the fun of it is a bit of knife maintenance yourself. You know, get a bit of wire wool, just give it a, a sort of buff. It'll take any little burrs and, you know, brighten up the brass a little bit and across the spine and the, the inner, inner side of the knife and uh, just brings it back to life. Good now, yeah. Who's doing? You, who's making your sheath? That's me as well. You're making the sheath. Yeah. As well. So, like I say, nothing, nothing leaves. So, Kydex. That was something that I only started doing that about five, six months ago. Kydex is the material. Yeah. So it comes in sheets. Um, you heat it up in a kind of oven, or you can actually put it in a frying pan, believe it or not, just dry, and it goes all floppy and flexible. Um, and then you, I use, I kind of use a fold, and I fold it over the knife, and then press it between two pieces of foam, and then within a minute or so, it's kind of gone hard, um, and then I take it out. Profile it, um, sand the edges, put the sort of nice smooth finish on there, drill the holes, put the rivets in, press the rivets in, and then um, I actually press it around the knife, so it's individual to each knife, and then just work that material back so that you've got just enough bite so the knife doesn't fall out, yeah. um, but it's obviously secure and safe in there. And that's a good material because it's impervious to frost, cold, you know, whatever else, and with the tech lock, you can slap it on your kit, mm -hmm. simple as. But uh, that's an option, you know, if people want Kydex, they'll usually ask for it. Most people, with the classic bushcraft knife or the classic sort of field knife, it's usually a leather sheath. So it's four millimeter Italian um, cowhide, all hand cut, stitched, dyed, and the rest of it. Um, yeah, it's going to last a lifetime. Saddle stitched is <laughs> a million times more than it needs, to be honest with you, but it's a good stitch. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's what I do. Did you see? Did you see any? Did you see any change to your business when uh, during during the pandemic? A little bit. I mean, um, I had trouble getting hold of some kit initially when obviously steel suppliers and things in Europe all slowed down, and everybody's like, "Well, you know, we're we still going to be able to get hold of this, that, and the other." But nothing, nothing serious. There was a little bit of a slump for about I don't know, maybe two or three weeks, and I think once people started getting furloughed, it, everything went the other way. So I was getting loads of orders because people were sat at home. They were still getting paid and they were idle hands. So they're going on the internet and looking for stuff to spend their money on. And my, my best sales sort of mechanism is word of mouth. So, you know, if someone gets a knife, you know, I'll get a phone call off of brother of or father of or friend of. And then that leads on to other people and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that's how, that's how it kind of works. Um, but, yeah, it went, um, it went crazy. Sort of March, April last year, it was insane. And I was having to say, you know, it's going to be sort of six months. Are you happy to wait? Yeah, no problem. It's almost like the the longer wait makes it a more aspirational and sort of wanted item, which is bizarre, bizarre because I didn't I didn't want to sort of say, oh, it's going to be nearly half a year. But they go, yeah, no problem, no problem at all. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. I'll so take your order, pop it in the book, and then, uh, you know, away it goes. And when I get around to it, I get around to it. What about people wanting to see where it's made? Do you, do you do anything? Because people who are willing to spend the money on something that you're making, like yeah. you're saying they've got that, it can almost be a bit of a, well, I don't want to say it. They've got emotional connection to the life of them. Yeah. Um, and they want... Yeah, yeah. I more. mean, we've got... Um, I mean, I have to be very mindful of this. And if I, if I know people, then obviously I'm, I'm happy for them to come around. But I have to do a little bit of background on people sometimes <laughs> because I get, you know, all sorts of folks getting in touch. Randoms, you know, sometimes people are a little bit twitchy. And I'm I, obviously, there's, my workshop's in my home. So I don't want anybody just rocking up because... First of all, they know where I live straight afterwards. You know, I've got kids as well, and I've got a missus, so I've got people to take care of, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very mindful of that. But I'm, I'm more than happy to send video and photographs, and I do that a lot, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, you're saying about the sort of, you know, people investing in the whole the sort of whole made thing. I've, I've put ashes into the adhesive, you know, people's, yeah, it's gone that far. Like, you really? Know. Yeah, it's made it. It was actually one of Nick's clients. I won't sort of say too much, but, yeah, you know, he sent me some, uh, some ashes, and uh, they were incorporated into the knife. Um, I've had another chap who wanted um, his parents' names etched on the inside of the knife, you know, and I've sent him a photograph before I glue it up. So for him, it's personal, you know, there's there's something in there. Oh, so the, his parents' names are in the hat. You can't even see it. No, you can't even see them. The he, kn he knows they're in there because I photographed it and filmed it as I did it. So, you know, he knows that they're... Oh, wow. Yeah, so and that's that's an easy easy win for me. It's no, it's no skin off my nose. I've got a chap at the moment who sent me a couple of pieces of coral which are near and dear to him. I don't know what the situation is, but he said, can you... Coal? Co coral, as in like... I think coal. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His father well, was a miner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, so uh, coral, <laughs> as in like in the sea. <laughs> but he wants that um, in his handle somewhere. So, you know, I've had to sort of 
come up with an idea about how I'm going to do that. So again, we've t- we've talked you know over that a, a couple of nights. How and, big is that? Oh, it's only small. It's a small piece, like you know like half a penny size. But yeah. um, it's obviously very near and dear to him. He sent me a couple of different pieces and said if you can incorporate one of these somewhere. So I'm like, yeah, you know, and it's, again, it's something a little bit different. It's another challenge which I'm going to meet, and it gives gives them another dimension. So you know, and I I do charge accordingly for that because it's it's going to take me time to work that out because I want it to obviously endure as well. So I'll have to come up with a clever way of doing that. So I do my own composite handles as well. So it's a mixture between wood and resin. Okay. And that was another thing that I just thought, right, I'll have a crack at that. So, you know, <clears throat> got myself a vacuum chamber and just sort of learned how to do that as well. So Why, what do you need the vacuum chamber for? Well, if you, um, if you mix resin and you put it in with wood, then it bubbles basically, so it will draw uh, it will draw the air out of the wood. If there's any 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 air in the wood, or if there's any air to be had, you'll get bubbles in the resin. So if you subject it to a vacuum, um, then it sucks all the bubbles out. Or or indeed, if you subject it to um, like a pressure pot, you know, like a pressure cooker. So in the inverse, you you put that much pressure on it that the bubbles go so small they're na- um, not visible by the naked eye. So, so when you say in f- you're mixing the resin with the wood, yeah, are you talking about there's Half and half. So I'll have a piece of wood at the front of the knife, and yeah. then it will join seamlessly into a piece of coloured resin mm. um, around the back as well. So I've done mainly kitchen knives, people like that. So um, I'm doing a set for a, a good friend of mine at the moment, a, bl- a blue, a really nice sort of Moroccan. Um, it's, it's kind of like a really dazzling bl- blue colour. And because it's pearlescent, what I do is mix the resin, and then I'll put the pearlescence in, and then I, I um, cast it into blocks. And then I'll cut it into you know slices, and I use that either side of the handle. But when they're finished and polished, they are mind-blowingly mm. beautiful. What about coloured blades? Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can I can force a patina onto the blade, so I can etch it with acid and other other chemicals to patina, like a like a, a darkening of the blade, if you yeah. like. So, I mean, if I rub that with just white wine vinegar or, or red wine vinegar overnight, it would take on a grey, a really grey colour because it's acidic, so it will rust as well really quickly, but it will take the shine off and take the sheen off the steel straight away. So some people want that uniformly across the whole blade, so I'll soak the blade <clears throat> for however long is needed in whatever medium to, to sort of give that. But colours-wise, I wouldn't I wouldn't, I wouldn't, spray anything onto the blades or anything like that. I don't think it's the, the, the coatings, unless you're sort of going down the Cerakote, um, Cranite, and a few of the others, which need special materials and tools to do, I couldn't. Um, I couldn't see myself doing that. I've got a few friends who do that. They do coating, so I could get a couple done if I needed to. Maybe I'll do a prototype. I don't know, but I've not found anybody sort of like you know chomping at the bit for that. Yeah, I wasn't sure how. I, I wasn't sure how it's done at all because mm. I, I thought you could. No, you wouldn't mix something with the seal, would you? You'd just completely compromise it. No, you're only, you're only affecting the oxidization of the surface when you do that anyway. So I've got a thing called a Vader etch, which is um, it's kind of like a dark, a very charcoal kind of. It's almost black, if you like, but I, I use um, a ferric chloride and cider vinegar mixture for that, so it's really aggressive, and I just leave it in there for like a couple of minutes, take it out, rub it with wire wool and water, and then baking soda to neutralize the acid, and then put it back in. I do that three or four times, and that's got a deep enough etch on the surface of the steel that it's kind of like, it will take no reflection whatsoever, so it's great for a tactical knife, yeah. um, you know, and some of the blokes like that as well, because so, if you oil it, it pops beautifully. Oh, really? Yeah, so I've got my Instagram's best, really, for all that sort of stuff. You know, kind of, if there's anything really really nice and catches the eye, I mean, I'm no photographer by any stretch, but if there's anything tidy, I'll just put it on the bench and I'll photograph it as best I can to demonstrate the sort of method um, and, and what the end product will be. What's most of your clientele? Civ Pop or X Mill or mostly? Uh, to be honest with you, yeah, the, the X Military side was what, what sort of catapulted us, uh, you know, got the business going. Uh, that and a guy called Nigel Campling. Um, you might know him. Oh, I'm going to kick myself now. I think his company is called Version 1.2. He's a media kind of guy, really lovely chap. Um, he lives in Colchester. Um, he did some of the recruiting stuff for the group, um, videos for, for the group. And then um, someone got in touch and said, look, he's looking for something to broaden out his profile and his and his um, his, pa- his portfolio. For the group? Yeah, for you know recruiting videos for 2.2 for and for SR, oh, SRR and that. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, he um, he came to see me. And uh, well, I actually got in touch on the phone and said, oh, you know, I want to I want to do something a bit more organic and a bit more grassroots. And this is at the I was still at the vets at the time. And I said, oh, well, you know, what's in it for you? Because I thought this something something's up here. No one no one gives you a free lunch like. Um, but as it was, he genuinely just wanted something a little bit. He said, I just want to come to a dusty shed. I said, well, I can guarantee you that, um, you know, and just film some sort of grassroots craftsmanship. So I said, yeah, come down. And I was still quite, you know, I was in the infancy of my learning at this point. I'd made a few. 
So he came down and um, spent a day with me, him and his lad, Adam Terry, um, who does a bit of stuff on Gogglebox, actually. He's quite a w- well-known chap. Really? <laughs> yeah, but just a really nice fella. So, um, Nigel, yeah. Nigel's son? No, he's Nigel's friend, uh, Nigel's Adam, friend. Adam Terry. Yeah, so they, they both came down for the day. Just like really nice chaps. And um, yeah, did the film. And um, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, got, he just said, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? And they were, you know, moving the cameras around and all the rest of it. So I just kind of like did a day's work. Um, we heated up a knife about 50 times and put it in the flames and he was getting the reflection and all the rest of it. Anyway, eight weeks later, he gives me a call saying, I've got this video for you. It gives me a link to a private thing on YouTube. And I was just like flipping heck. You know, it's like, that's unreal. It was superb. You know, the music and everything else. And I was just like, wow, so, you know, I can't thank you enough type thing. Um, and I said, are you sure? You know, and I, I've since made him a knife, obviously, you know, and he's, we've become quite good friends. But he's he's good, you know, just sort of good mentor as well. He gives me a ring every few months, see how I'm doing and that. And if he can offer any advice on whatever he, he does. And he uses the knife in anything that he can get it into shoot-wise. <laughs> the knife is there. <laughs> he did some stuff for some like, cold storage gloves. And he's like got it on this rotating table, you know, with a knife in his hand. But, uh, yeah, that, that video was awesome. I put it onto... Is when I started out on the social media, I put it on Facebook, and overnight it had like two thousand views. Really, so that was a real nice lead into the kind of civilian side of things. But yeah, you know, I'm I'm sort of grateful to my my colleagues and my uh, my network really for for getting us the, the foothold and getting a start. I think it would have been quite difficult without that. But, yeah, uh, and they're the people you got to tap into first, right? In your business, is mm-hmm. the people nearest and dearest to you, which, yeah. which can be hard because you're you're also putting yourself out there massively. Yeah, aren't you? yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it can yeah. be quite daunting. Are you are, are you tapping into the uh, farming industry? Not really. I've made one knife for a farmer. He's a local chap. But um, they are just like, you know, as long as they can cut baling twine, with they're happy. So it's just like a pen knife for them usually. They're not really uh, big into buying, you know, sort of. Really? I would have nah. thought. I know. I thought about it. But uh, another thing where I am as well is I'm English. So, you know, they will go Welsh every single time. <laughs> I know the name is Brechva, you know, which is a Welsh name. You know, my, my, I live in Wales. My family's Welsh. My kids go to Welsh frigging school, for God's sake, you know. But no, oh, he's English, you know. And there's, there is a bit of prejudice there. Your kids go to Welsh school? So Welsh, yeah. Welsh speaking school? Welsh speaking school, oh, yeah. Quality. Yeah, so. Quality. Yeah, my boy's in his A-levels now. So, uh, yeah, he's, yeah, he doesn't, he just kind of gets on with it now. But I just think, crikey, you know, even doing GCSE in English was hard work, you know. So they, they, both speak Welsh fluently and and English. We speak a lot of English at home. Obviously, I can get by with Welsh, but uh, I'm not I'm not brilliant by any chance. My daughter would love me to do more. She's always on at me about learning more Welsh. But I'm like, when I've got time, <laughs> you know. Is it? Is, does your missus speak Welsh as the first language? Then? Uh, yeah, I mean, she she works in Welsh medium as well with the council. So uh, uh. yeah, so she does. She's she's fluent in both languages and she can write, read, and um, speak it fluently. So. You know, it's a great skill if you live in, 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 in a Welsh community. It really is. It's a you know real sort of force multiplier for any individual who can speak Welsh. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, it's, well, any second language as well. Yeah, any fantastic. Language. My lad's doing a Chinese course in, at the moment. Like, school holidays. I know. <laughs> so, yeah. That's a bonkers language. I know. So, have, you, have you ever seen the way they do maths? I, I, oh, God. You know, I, I've, I've, I've trouble with normal arithmetic, never honestly, mind Chinese maths. The way they do, the way they do math, and math, you know, we'll write down three plus four equals flipping seven. For example, they they have like a they write they have a box. It's a weird. I can't. It's hard to explain. I looked at it once. I go, what what on earth? Yeah, why with? would you do that? Yeah, bonkers. No, not for me. Crazy. No, honestly, if I have any drama, I mean, I I'm like you know you see the old adage, measure twice, cut once. I'm the measure six times. You know, check it on your calculator, guy. I'll just yeah, put. I just because if you if you the hours that go into one of these, yeah. you can't afford mm. to get it wrong. It's not so much with the knives, right? It's, it's with wood and stuff. You know, I'll measure like halfway across something, and then I'll be like doesn't look like halfway and I've, I've like i've read it wrong off a scale or something you know and it's not my eyes it's just my head is up my ass sometimes and i'm just like oh my god that was almost costly because it's like a 70 quid piece of wood you know so i yeah. check check and i double check every single time you know i very rarely make mistakes now but if i you know if i've got the older uh, the, the speed chimp on my shoulder if i'm in a rush then it's going to be there's going to be trouble you know i've cut my finger on a bandsaw a couple of times you know like, yeah I've, I've had to just be careful because if i'm in a bit of a rush and you know, it's very easy to get complacent with machines that can, you know, do you some serious harm. So, you know, I've had my finger in the grinder a couple of times. I've been pulled in, you know, round the wheel and whatnot. And, uh, yes, yes, I'm glad I've got emergency stop buttons and stuff, you know. That's a throwback from school, actually, because it's my workshop. I can have anything I want in there and I can do, I can wire it up or, you know, have have it safe or not. But I always remember those big red sort of panic buttons on the floor and like in easy teacher reach. And I thought, I need to get a couple of those, because if I ever have a drama, I need to be able to stop that machine quick. And I tell you, they've, they've saved my bacon a few times. 
just a quick stamp of the foot, oof, and it stops. You think, shush, that could have been worse. Christ, don't be doing anything like that. Nope. Yeah. My God. What do you do for downtime? <sighs> a bit of fishing. I do enjoy a bit of fishing. Not fly fishing. No, no, no. Go for that. No, no. Nobody I, knows. No, there's, um, there's a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can fly fish. You know, so, but no, it's not something I'd choose to do. So, um, yeah, there's a few sort of like local ponds, local lakes near us. So I'll just go and flick a lure about, catch perch and pike or, you know, carp, whatever. I don't specifically chase a, 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 a species. I just go and have a, a day out. And if I spend a couple of hours there and I've had enough, I go home. You know, I, I like to watch movies. You know, I, I love film. Um or if I'm if I'm sort of starting a new process or something, I just like to do my homework on that. So I'll go and watch videos on wood stabilization or you know other things, and you know just just learn more about things really. So on that then, how is, what are you what are you looking at at the moment in terms of uh, to add to your arsenal of skills? So and abilities I'm, with knives? I'm doing a lot on Viking swords at the moment. Um, because I did a couple of swords last year, did some swords. Stuff. Yeah, so I made a, I made a few swords for um, for a film that went out, and I also did one for charity. I did one for a dinner night, a, a huge double-handed broadsword that went to auction. Um, and I've done a couple of swords for you know charity dinner nights and things like that. I enjoy doing them because it's bigger. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of more, they're more complex because they they can be highly more highly scrutinised. Um, but they, are, I, I like working on them because they're they're pretty straightforward. How do you how do you treat them? How do you get them in the oven? So like I, I I have to. They don't go into the oven. So I've got a forge as well. I've got a huge gas forge. Um, so I have to be very clever with the temperature and heat distribution. So to to, to overcome that, I watched a a guy, a guy in Holland, um, and he's got this kind of thing called a ribbon burner, which uh, is very complex and it evenly heats the blade so that you don't get any soft spots and all the rest of it. And I thought, right, how can I? How can I distribute that in my forge? So I got a piece of cast iron drain pipe, put some heat bricks in the bottom of it, and then I let the gas warm it up. And because of its thickness and the nature of the cast iron, it evenly heated and distributed throughout the steel. I had one failure where it didn't work, so I just cranked the temperature up a bit more, and I did it again. And then it worked a, tr- worked a treat. So I do that now for anything up to anything sort of 12 inches and over. I'll use the the uh, the tube sort of method. But it can be quite tricky with some of the more complex steels, but I keep it with the swords and things like that, just simple 1095 or a, a simple carbon steel, which is quite forgiving. Still still hard, still hold an edge. But, you know, I suppose people who are after those sorts of things, if they're buying a sword from a charity dinner night to go swinging around, chopping trees up, they're in the wrong game. Yeah. So, you know, this is just like beautiful aspirational items that, you know, they have on their desk or in their kind of interest rooms and stuff. Yeah, what was the... What- what was the film that you made the three three swords? It's for? not it's not been released yet. So it's still under oh, it's still under em, embargo. Yeah, so yeah, but I'm hoping for more of that sort of thing. You know, so that was a he's a he just got in touch and said, you know, can you make us a couple of swords? One they have like close up swords where their details got to be you know ready to sort of receive scrutiny and then kind of off off camera or kind of in in foreground swords where they can be a little bit more rough and ready. Yeah, I was about to ask why were they yeah. why would they ask you to make swords and can you just buy some pikey thing? But yeah, no, yeah exactly. Yeah, so uh, but um. I, I don't know. I, I love the I love the swords at the moment. So yeah, the Viking swords. I just want to you know I've been doing a lot in the house as well. And I said to the missus, "Would you fancy having a sword up there?" And, I, and usually I'd think, oh, "That's a bit bow." <laughs> like I mean, I'm not talking like you know having sort of you know eBay Lord of the Rings gear. I'm, I said you know just a, a really nice sort of Scandinavian early early sort of nine ninth century you know 900 BC Viking sort of style sword. Well, what's that style? What's particular? About uh, without without a picture, it's quite difficult to show you, really. But uh, it's just a straightforward blade with one fuller down the middle, yeah. which is obviously the, the channel, um, which was actually for weight saving. People, so it's a blood channel. It does provide you know easy lack of suction, but it was actually for weight saving because the blades were bloody heavy. A very simple guard, which is just slightly bigger than the top of the hand. Simple grip, which was leather around string and or string and gut, and then a two piece pommel, which went on the back, and then to sort of seal it all together and tighten it up. They just used to heat the end of the, the blade, uh, the pommel rather, and just wallop it with a hammer. And the pressure of that piece of metal spreading would tighten everything up and just, you know, that's how they did it in the in the, in the bad old days when it was, uh, you know, when they had this sort of coal forges and whatnot. Some of the stuff they could achieve back then is, is frighteningly detailed. I don't know how they did it. Um, so, I mean, if they can do that, you know, <laughs> 900 BC, I'm sure I can achieve it now in 2021. What length are those Viking swords? They're kind of quite short, so I suppose really, I don't know, kind of up to two feet, I suppose, really, 24, oh, quite 30 short. inches. Yeah, it's quite short, yeah. More of a chopping weapon than a, than a, than a stabber, you know. How big's the broadsword they did? Oh, gosh. I could touch the ceiling in here with it if I didn't too, and it was enormous, absolutely massive. Like a Scottish claymore, 
you know, a big a big two handed broadsword. It was huge, and oh. I, I put it onto an oak plinth. Um, yeah, yeah oh. so it had a beautiful wooden handle. And what that, that what went was the weight on it? Probably sort of three and a half kilos. Something Jesus. Like that. Yeah, it was insane. <laughs> but that went, went for twenty eight grand. Someone bought that. Oh my god! I know. So you know, I mean, I, I that's that's an awesome. You know, it went to the, all the money to charity to a really good cause. Yeah. So that that just makes all the heartache and all the all the trouble. I mean, twenty eight k. It's a huge amount of money. Pounds. Yeah, and I've done other things. <clears throat> I've done like presentation knives that have gone into boxes, and you know, people have bid twenty grand on them. You know, straight away. And I suppose really they're supporting the charity, but it's nice that they're items that people want because I suppose they are quite unique. Um, you know, so if anybody gets in touch, and I'm probably going to shoot myself in the foot here, but um, you know, I will help out where I can. But obviously, I can't help out everybody, so I've had to say to some people, I just haven't got the time at the moment. You know, um, but if I can, I do. Yeah, absolutely. I'm probably going to regret saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Bang on, mate. Um, anything we haven't covered? That you want to cover? No, I think we're pretty good. No, it's been a. I've really enjoyed it. It's nice to sort of talk about the process and the procedures and stuff. And it can get quite technical and a bit like, oh. But, um, you know, I suppose if you keep it light and interesting, then it's uh, it, it's 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 manageable, you know, and it's nice for people to listen to. It's, it's, mate, it's, it's, it's nice to listen because it, it's, uh, you know, it's one thing, it's one thing, get, give me a give, gift like this. Like, <laughs> sure, like, it's another thing, understanding exactly the, the what yeah. went into it, how it's done and yeah. why it's done like that and who did it and the, to the time it yeah. I really appreciate it. I think that's why I started the YouTube channel last year. I want to sort of swear I want to pick up again. I think um, when I've got a bit more time in the next couple of months is just to sort of demonstrate the, the actual amount of time and detail that goes into it because it's really hard to sort of do that verbally. But if there's a, a pictorial guide, you know, people go like, "Wow, that really is outrageously detailed," you know. And then I suppose really it validates, you know, the price of a, of something like that. You know, I've never had anybody who's gotten in touch and sort of made an inquiry about a knife because I think they do their homework. They know that it's going to be, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be 30 or 40 quid. So I've never had anybody go, oh, geez, that's way too much, you know, because they know what they're getting. Um, and often those people will come back and they'll order other knives for other people as gifts and things because they know that they're going to endure and be legacy items. So that's that's really nice as a maker. It's the, it's the, the highest sort of praise and accolade I can have is people coming back and mm. ordering more products. Um, so, yeah, I'm, um, yeah, happy days. There you go. Mate, pretty pleasure. Thanks. Um, good luck with it. And website is brechtforknives. Yeah, if you just Google Brech for knives and it's um, B R E C H F A, so Brech V. So yep. happy days. Easy peasy. All right. Mate, I'll come down and see you in Carmarthen. Oh, it'd be, be a pleasure. But yeah, you're more than welcome. Sweet. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Cheers, Cheers mate. Cheers to you.